Hi, good afternoon everyone and welcome to Precision's Webinar Wednesday. Today's webinar is Case Studies, Patterns, and Clinical Pearls, the HPA Access with Dr. Carrie Jones. My name is Amy Paoletti and I'm a member of the Dutch Education and Marketing team and I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to be with us today. We know many of you are now operating your clinical services virtually and taking care of your patients is essential to their overall individual and collective health. We also realize testing plays a vital role in your practice. If you're not familiar with the Dutch test, Dutch is an acronym. It stands for Dried Urine Test for Comprehensive Hormones. Our lab testing offers simple and convenient collection, at-home collection for your patients. Uh, we have a very unique way of reporting test results, if you haven't seen them already, that simplifies and assists cl clinicians' understanding for their patient's hormone and health picture. Additionally, we have an outstanding clinical consulting team who are always available to answer questions from all the clinicians who work with us about patient results and treatment considerations. For anyone who's listening who might not have an account currently with us at Precision, I'd like to remind everybody that uh, we do offer a terrific deal of 50% off of up to five test kits when you first uh, sign on to work with us. On the, the slide that we're showing on the screen right now, you can contact our customer service team via phone to get an account set up, or you can go to our website, become a provider to open your account today. We, we make it pretty seamlessly for you, and um, we're ready to help you in any way we can, even in drop shipping kits directly to your patients right now, uh, considering all the telemedicine uh, practices that are open right now. So I wanted to go through just a couple housekeeping items before we start. Um, we'll make sure we try to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the webinar. Um, you can send your questions in the questions section on the bottom side panel of your screen. I also wanna remind everybody, if you miss anything today, if for any reason you need to log off or you have any technical difficulties, which we sure hope you're not, um, we will be sending the on-demand recording to all of you tomorrow along with the presentation slides. So the concept of stress has long invaded our social and biological reality, and this is never more true than during this COVID-19 pandemic. It is a daunting task for all clinicians to determine which patients are becoming overwhelmed by the effects of stress as well develop individualized support protocols to help patients regain their well-being. Dr. Jones will share patient cases along with Dutch test laboratory results, providing a thorough review of symptoms, lab results, and treatment considerations. I know many of you uh, online with us today are probably familiar with Dr. Jones, but just in case you're not, Dr. Jones is the Medical Director for Precision Analytical. She is also a naturopathic doctor whose passion and expertise lies in the areas of hormonal, adrenal, and thyroid health. Dr. Jones graduated from the National University of Natural Medicine in Portland, Oregon, and went on to complete her residency in women's health, endocrinology, and hormones. She later graduated from Grand Canyon University with a master's in public health. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with Dr. Jones. Thank you so much, Amy. I appreciate that. We're going to, I think I have, yep. You got it. I think I have it. Perfect. Okay. Let's dive into today's webinar, Case Studies, Patterns, and Clinical Pearls, all about the HPA axis. We do have, true to form, we do have over 100 slides uh, on this because what we were talking talking about at Dutch is that the common questions we get are, I know the basics, I understand the basics about how to read the test, but how do I learn more? How do I go deeper? How do I find those like next layers of clinical pearls in Dutch patterns that can be really helpful? And that's what we're going to go into today. So let's talk just for a minute about Dutch testing. Again, um, some of this will be a little bit review before we jump into the patterns. If you are newer to Dutch, or if you just didn't quite realize this about Dutch, we will only talk about the HPA axis today. But just as a reminder, when you're looking at dried urine, the benefit of it is we get so many more 
markers and metabolites compared to something like serum or saliva, which really sets the Dutch result apart from somebody just getting saliva or just getting a serum draw. And you'll see that especially as we get into the cortisol markers. But you can see we have like estrogen metabolism, phases one and two. We have your, your androgens, your 5-alpha reductase. We look at cortisol and cortisone. We look at some um, organic acid nutritional markers for B6, B12, glutathione. We look at your dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine metabolites. We look at an oxidative stress marker known as 8 um, uh, OHDG, melatonin, and then cycle mapping, which I'll show you here in just a second. With Dutch, the original concept was the idea of dried urine. So it's an easier collection for those who do not like to spit or passive drool into a tube for saliva or who are afraid to get their blood drawn or who just need all the extra information that dried urine provides. We do offer the cortisol awakening response, which does require swabs, or excuse me, saliva. And because the cortisol awakening response has to be collected rather quickly, we have opted to use salivate swabs as opposed to saliva tubes. The reason for this are the swabs are just literally what they sound like. They're little swabs that you pop into your mouth, get wet and stick back into the tube. This allows for a rapid collection for a truer cortisol awakening response result. There's no drooling involved, no spitting involved. Really helpful for those patients who have dry mouth, especially in the morning when they're struggling when they first wake up but have to collect on waking. And it's the salivate swabs that are used in research. So Dutch tries to make it really easy between the dried urine collection and of course, salivate swabs. So we will be talking about the combo, urine and saliva today with the cortisol awakening response and just the HPA axis in general. Many of you want to know, is there research regarding dried urine? There is. Last year in 2019, there is published data that showed a serum, estradiol, and progesterone had a great correlation looking at dried urine, estradiol, and progesterone. This was published in uh, BMC Chemistry. And you can see as an example, you, the, this is uh, progesterone on the top, estradiol on the bottom and the, looking at both urine and serum, and there's a fairly good correlation, which is wonderful. To be published though, this is data to be published comparing dry urine, dried urine to salivary cortisol results. We are often asked if um, you're used to doing salivary cortisol, what is the research comparing it to dried urine? So this will be published this year. There's statistical equivalence between the rise and fall in saliva and the rise and fall in urine for free cortisol throughout the day. And you can see the saliva, the are the black dotted lines on the left and the urine is the solid line. Now it appears shifted, doesn't it? Now remember, it shifted because urine has a little bit of a delayed response as it goes through the kidneys, into the bladder and then out into the urine. So when you do a morning saliva, when you wake up and take the test at eight o'clock in the morning and then 8.30, that's exactly the saliva cortisol at your eight o'clock and 8.30, whereas there is a couple, like two hour delay-ish when it comes to going through your kidneys and bladder. So the pattern is the same. It's just offset a little bit because of the function of cortisol going through kidneys and bladder. But this research will be published and we will be sure to let it. Choosing the right test, we have the Dutch complete. This is all, our, all dried urine, no saliva. This gives you a great overview of all the hormones. You get your metabolites. You have a fifth overnight collection for those patients who struggle with insomnia. We do include, of course, all the organic acids such as HVA, VMA, the B6, the B12, the glutathione marker, and the 8-OHDG marker. The Dutch Plus gives you all of that, plus we include five salivary swab samples so you can collect the cortisol awakening response and the afternoon and nighttime sample, plus we include an extra overnight salivary sample for those patients who struggle with insomnia. So the Dutch Plus is where we include more specifically the cortisol awakening response, but we still give you the option for those patients who struggle with insomnia in the, at night and then waking in the morning. So it's more comprehensive, more data points, which helps for better patient care. When people ask me, what's the difference? More data points, more collection for, more, for, for uh, maybe more comprehensive patient care. So understanding the CAR, if you are new to the CAR, maybe perhaps missed the stress resiliency webinar, the CAR collection is a little different than your standard salivary collection. It is first collected immediately on waking, 30 minutes later, and 30 minutes after that. So waking 30-30. It's very quick. The reason for that is the cortisol awakening response 
should rise at least 50% over baseline within the first 30 minutes of waking and then gradually start to fall down. If you collect in the morning and around lunch, you have missed the cortisol awakening response. This is why we wanna really hone in and this is why the salivate swabs are so helpful because you're collecting every 30 minutes and that requires a lot of saliva if you're just doing passive drool into a tube. We want to continue on with the diurnal pattern. We do want a collection around dinner and of course a collection at bedtime. Why is the car so important? Why do we focus on this as our whole topic today is about the HPA axis? Well, we know that the uh, appropriate level of the car helps dictate energy levels, your resiliency, your levels of feeling stressed out, which is so critical right now, your level of feeling alertness in the morning, blood sugar management. Remember your cortisol is a glucocorticosteroid. Glucose is the number one thing that it manages. So it's very important to get your cortisol diurnal pattern correct to really help with your blood sugar management. The car directly impacts your mood, such as morning anxiety, panic, depression, or worry. It impacts autoimmune development and progression, inflammatory regulation, infection regulation. Think about those people who wake up in pain in the morning. This could really be a cortisol-related response. It affects memory and recall, whether it's high or low, and it in, um, impacts cancer outcomes. So understanding the car really hits a lot of these um, you know, important key markers when it comes to health. So I call the car, uh, I have a force analogy with it. So the traditional four point cortisol test where you have a grand sweeping view through the day is still very helpful. I, I'm not saying that it's not, I think it's very helpful, but it's like looking down on a forest from a helicopter. You see the entire forest, you miss some of the details. When you add in the cortisol awakening response to your entire through the day diurnal pattern, you get that up close view of your trees, plants, shrubs, ground cover, and animal life. And that can help you make better decisions. So does everyone need a car test? Of course not. It depends on their health history, their symptoms, and their goals. Not everyone is, is that the adrenals, the HPA is the focus. But of course, that will be the focus of today's webinar. Included in All Complete and All Dutch Plus, we do have the organic acids that looks like this. And again, the B12, the B6 glutathione, dopamine metabolite, norepinephrine, epinephrine metabolite, melatonin measured as 6-hydroxy melatonin sulfate, oxidative stress marker 8-OHDG. So then we have the Dutch cycle mapping, which is probably my most favorite test for the cycling woman. Best for women who are or should be cycling, and it can be combined with a Dutch complete. When you're looking at a cycle mapping, basically you are collecting um, one dried urine strip almost every day of your cycle, or when you, when you should have a cycle. In the results, the estrogens are on top. The normal uh, reference ranges are the black dotted lines. Her estradiol and estrone are represented by solid blue and red lines. In the bottom box, you will see progesterone. Again, same thing. The black dotted lines are the reference range for progesterone. The blue and the red lines are her alpha and beta pregnenolone metabolites. And you can see that estrogen should you know, rise in the late follicular phase prior to ovulation and then drop down, whereas progesterone should rise in the luteal phase, phase after ovulation. So why would I consider a cycle mapping test? Why is it my most favorite test? Because it really gives you wonderful answers for those women who struggle with all sorts of hormonal um, complaints throughout their cycle. And I have highlighted the top three things that I love to use it for. Women struggling with infertility, women whose hormonal symptoms fluctuate through the cycle. Meaning she says to you, I get migraines at ovulation and during PMS, or I am extremely depressed around ovulation and at PMS, or she's very specific in her days. I have these symptoms on days 10, 12, 18, and 24 until I get my until my period starts. A one-day test is not going to give you the answers for that. That's what's really nice about the cycle mapping, that you can see the entire month and say, okay, let's see what happens on those specific days. Let's see what happens at ovulation uh, to, to bring on these symptoms. Here's a great case example. Again, I know we're talking about HPA axis and patterns of pearls today, but I have a, I have um, just a, like a sneaker case in here for you on uh, the uh, cycle mapping. So this is a 24 or 25 year old with 34 day cycles. 
She has heavy periods, moderate to severe PMS, and her blood work was quote unquote normal. So she saw her, her uh, practitioner, right? Her conventional practitioner who drew blood work and said, everything's fine, you're fine. I don't, I don't know why you have problems. So if she, uh, she had done her, her blood test on day 23, so she did get it in the luteal phase, which is, you know, that's great. Oftentimes uh, we know that when a patient sees a conventional practitioner, they will just draw their hormones at any random date. But this, in this case, they drew it on day 23. And what I have highlighted in the purple box is if she had done a blood draw then, or she did a blood draw then, of course it would be normal. That's the point when it's normal. So when she got her one day test, it sure was normal. It's normal on the cycle mapping. It's normal in the blood draw. That makes sense. She drew her progesterone on day 23. Again, in the purple dotted box, it's normal on the Dutch test. It's normal in blood draw. That's not the problem. But the problem, when we add in the entire cycle mapping and look through the entire month, she gets this extra bump in estradiol um, after day, from day 25 until she you know, gets her period at day 34. So she drops down only to bump back up. So that surge is getting mixed in the single day test. And that is likely what is contributing to a lot of her symptoms and causing problems. And so by having this information, you can say, oh, you actually are not normal. You have this extra bump and we need to address that, especially as we get close to day 25 to make sure that this levels out and is much better symptomatic wise for her. All right, let's jump in to pearls and patterns. Remember this, even though it seems like I'm talking about all of the tests and all the hormones, we are gonna focus entirely on the, the uh, sort of next layer down when it comes to our adrenal page, the HPA page. So just as a general reminder, I am asked quite a bit, my patient has normal cortisol, but they're tired. How could that be? Please remember cortisol is not the only reason for fatigue. And if their cortisol pattern is normal, their cortisol, everything is normal, that it's entirely possible it's due to other causes. Everything from thyroid, right, to neurotransmitters, to nutritional deficiencies like iron, to B vitamins, of course, right? It could be infections uh, that, that they have going on. It's, there's so many reasons for fatigue that I just wanted to remind you of this. What does the waking cortisol point reflect? So when they, when they urinate on the piece of paper, when they wake up at six in the morning, what does that reflect? Well, as urine has to go through the kidneys and into the bladder, it reflects the cortisol that was made and put in the bladder through the night. This is of course different from a saliva test or even a serum test because a waking saliva test reflects cortisol in that exact moment, not through the night. So in this example, the patient reports difficulty staying asleep. Their waking point, that their, their first urine point is elevated. They're out of the blue shaded range um, on the Dutch test. And so what this tells me is that they fell asleep okay, but at some point in the night, their HPA axis turned on and their cortisol production ramped up. Their ACTH went up and their cortisol went up as well. And as a result, they woke up and they have this elevated through the night cortisol. What are some reasons for through the night cortisol elevation? Obviously stress in their life, anticipatory stress, uh, you know, waking up thinking about things, their mind is racing, poor sleep habits, maybe their partner snores, maybe their kid got into bed with them, maybe their animals are disruptive, maybe they snore and they're waking themselves up, blood sugar and insulin issues, having drank alcohol prior to bed, Gut health issues, uh, we know that certain parasites and worms are more active uh, in the night. Inflammation and then just general infection. So for example, if they're becoming, if they're getting sick, right? If they're feeling flu-like and it's, it's starting to happen in the middle of the night, then they may wake up with a fever and their cortisol is elevated. So these are just some examples to keep in mind. Speaking of that uh, cortisol, how can cortisol cause insomnia and AM depression, commonly known as melancholic depression? So in this actual case, this person reported that they woke up and felt extremely depressed. And as they went through their day, their depression actually got better. And they wanted to know, one, why can't they sleep? But now we know that because their cortisol is going up. And two, why are they so depressed, particularly in the morning? So as I said, the waking cortisol is high. This reflects the high cortisol through the night and was probably suppressing melatonin. So melatonin might start to come out normally um, 
in in the day or excuse me in the night as the as the darkness is coming and then it might get blunted and so it shuts down sooner and it can result in waking but that cortisol in this case remains elevated through the morning and we know an elevated cortisol can divert tryptophan away from serotonin and down towards the kynurenine pathway which we like the kynurenine pathway because especially if it makes nad right we like nad but when we're looking at how tryptophan can be divided it can make serotonin which then goes on to make melatonin and the organic acid 5-HIAA or it and most predominantly it goes down the kynurenine pathway and hopefully makes NAD so excessive cortisol such as high cortisol in the morning but also estrogen dominance um, inflammation and lipopolysaccharide LPS from gram negative bacteria have been shown to divert away from serotonin and subsequently melatonin and push more down the kynurenine pathway. So it is entirely possible that that high cortisol in the morning, that waking high cortisol can result in morning depression in some people. So if you have a patient who reports morning melancholic depression, check their cortisol and see what's going on. You may also, now that you know this, of course, check their estradiol, Check them for inflammation and gut health. Look at LPS, lipopolysaccharide. And that's what you're going to address. That's what you're going to go after to help get proper serotonin, melatonin production again. So adopting or addressing all the causes for the high through the night cortisone, or excuse me, cortisol, evaluate their actual sleep habits, adopt a healthy sleep hygiene routine, including who is sleeping in the room with them. It's amazing what people will put up with in the name of their family or their partner, their significant other marriage, or their, in my case, my dog. <laughs> and that can really affect the, how somebody sleeps through the night and subsequently their cortisol. Focusing on products that calm before bed, assuming uh, calming is what they need if it's not you know, blood sugar or something like that. And then you could consider morning serotonin support, uh, such as 5-HTP. Please be very careful though, if they are already on an antidepressant, and please be very careful not to potentially deplete dopamine. Remember that to make serotonin and to make dopamine require the same enzyme. And if you are giving 5-HTP and trying to push serotonin, you could deplete that enzyme could then focus on serotonin and deplete or not focus on dopamine. And now they're left feeling maybe less depressed, but over time potentially less motivated, right? And then seeking behavior because they're missing out on dopamine. So just keep that in mind. What is the inflammation pattern when we're looking at the Dutch test? So here are all the markers that we look at for inflammatory indicators on Dutch. We can't necessarily tell you why they're inflamed, it's kind of like a CRP. We can tell you they are inflamed, but it's not specific. You will still have to go down that rabbit hole. In your patient, if you see 5-alpha reductase upregulated, so that's the enzyme that converts the androgens down the more potent, like DHT pathway, right? 5-alpha reductase. Aromatase is upregulated, so their conversion of androgens to estrogens in males or females is resulting in excessive amounts of estrogen. Their DHEAS, the sulfated form, is a lot lower on the dial compared to their metabolites, androsterone and etiocalanolone. I'll show you that what that visually looks like in the next slide. But inflammation lowers sulfation. It decreases the ability to put the S on DHEA. This means they may not have low DHEA. They just have low ability to sulfate. And as a result, the DHEA will push downstream and look at their androsterone and etiocalanolone. You will see estrogen favoring the 4 and the 16 hydroxy with phase one metabolism. You will see elevated cortisol metabolism. You will see elevated free cortisol, right? Because everything's ramped up with inflammation, especially acute inflammation. When you're looking at that adrenal page, you will see cortisol metabolism favoring THF. We have a little gauge that leans to THE and THF, and this is favoring THF, which is the activation of cortisol. This is the upregulation of that enzyme, 11-beta-HSD1. On the organic acid page, you will see elevated kynurinate, possibly low or high elevated pyroglutamate, indicating a need for glutathione, and an elevated 8-OHDG. Now, 8-OHDG is a DNA damage marker. Everyone goes to worst case scenario and assumes it's probably cancer um, related, 
It does not have to be. It can be exposure related to chemicals or toxicants, things like that. We have seen it elevated with severe long-term insomnia with very low melatonin because melatonin, of course, is very potent antioxidant. We've seen an elevated 8-OHDG with very severe suicidal type depression. So it doesn't have to be cancer, but it is an indicator that inflammation is present. So here is an acute inflammatory state involving high cortisol. I had a practitioner um, email me once and because their cortisol looked very similar to this and said, my patient is a very calm, run of the mill, average man. There is no way that this is his cortisol. There is absolutely no chance this can be his cortisol. It cannot be this elevated. When I pulled the young man's requisition form and I was reading over it, at the very bottom of page two, he wrote, I broke my arm the night before, spent it in the ER, went home and still collected the Dutch test. So cortisol absolutely goes up with a broken arm. <laughs> this is exactly what acute inflammation can look like. When you are having your patient collect the test, maybe talk with them about if anything weird happens, call you as the practitioner and let you know so you can determine if they should continue to test, to test because what I said to this practitioner was, well, we know their HPA axis works and we know they have a proper <laughs> response to an acute inflammatory situation. And why don't we wait until they are out of their cast and healed and we will repeat the cortisol and see where they're at. Speaking of that DHEAS, like I said, when you have inflammation with DHEA and sulfation, this is what it will look like. Now, um, I will say a little caveat. These dials may look funny to you in these colors, right? These are not our typical Dutch dials per se. These dials are coming. So you are getting a sneak peek of dials that are uh, coming in new Dutch reports where we will put the uh, uh, age ranges right on the dial and make them a little easier to read. So DHEAS is still a, it's still a dial, it just looks a little bit different. So DHEAS in this case is low, it's 29, so the, the arrow down. And then you will see that this person favors the 5-alpha pathway, the androsterone is high, but their etiocalanolone is right, right in the middle at 1100 as well. And so they don't have a DHEA problem, the body is able to take DHEA, make androsinidione, make etiocalanolone and, um, and androsterone. It just can't sulfate. Sulfation is the problem. And so in this case, you're looking to address the inflammation, if you, if you know what it is, um, to figure out sulfation. Now, it could also be issues, mutations, you know, in the SNP, the SALT, S-U-L-T, the SALT SNP that um, is uh, helpful for, you know, responsible for putting the S on DHEA. But inflammation is a big one. So 5-alpha reductase, speaking of which, how do you treat 5-alpha reductase? Of course, treat the cause, address the inflammation. But what else will increase 5-alpha reductase? Uh, insulin and um, excessive adipocytes. So reduce insulin and reduce adiposity are the, the, the most sort of basic helpful ways to reduce that 5-alpha reductase. So if I go back, again, it's on that right side, that 5-alpha, that androsterone, or the 5-alpha DHT, you know, depending what dial you're looking at, um, if you're favoring that, inflammation, insulin, and adiposity can increase it. Commonly, medications that are used, just as an FYI, spironolactone, which is not actually a 5-alpha blocker, but it is an aldosterone antagonist. It is an androgen receptor antagonist, so it, it, that's why spironolactone is commonly given for women who have acne and hirsutism and it weakly inhibits androgen production. So it's not a 5-alpha blocker, but it is an androgen modulator. Of course, everyone knows about finasteride or dutasteride, which are 5-alpha inhibitors. These are your true inhibitors. They can have a lowering effect, though, on the 5-alpha metabolites of progesterone and of cortisol. There are, a, I think, five different 5-alpha reductase enzymes. And if they are all inhibited with like finasteride um, or dutasteride, then you will notice it in the progesterone and in the cortisol results as well. So please keep that in mind. Now, what do we use? What are the natural 5-alpha inhibitors? These are only Band-Aids. These do not cure. While you're working on the inflammation, the insulin, and the adiposity, though, these are very helpful. Saw palmetto, stingy nettle root, pygium, EGCG from green tea, and reishi mushroom. Yes, they can absolutely also affect the progesterone and the cortisol because they are 5-alpha inhibitors. With these, though, with for women, 
you will often find them in prostate supports. So just warn your female patients that you're fully aware that they do not have a prostate. You just need the herbs inside. Inflammation on the organic acid, you'll have a high kynurinate, you will have a high or low pyroglutamate, which is a glutathione indicator, and at the very bottom, that 8-OHDG. All right, what about an elevated MMA? What does that indicate and which B12 is deficient? So when we're looking at MMA, uh, methylmalonic or methylmalonate, uh, they're same thing, methylmalonic acid, methylmalonate, uh, same thing. It's adenosyl cobalamin. Adenosyl cobalamin is the um, form preferred by the mitochondria. So really important for those who have a lot of fatigue. So if you suspect it's cortisol and their cortisol test is relatively normal, look at their MMA and see if it's, you know, in normal range. An elevated MMA on the Dutch test indicates a low adenosyl B12. Now, there are other forms of B12, of course, methylcobalamin being the one that lots of people talk about, but all forms of supplemental B12 are first converted to cobalamin, and then um, the methyl and or adenosyl B12 are formed from there on. Now, I have read this over and over and over again. Anecdotally, though, practitioners routinely report, and myself included, if they give adenos adenosyl um, B12, when adenosyl is needed, it seems to work better than somebody who is given methylcobalamin for an adenosyl need. I hope that makes sense. So in the literature, we keep I keep reading how, how cobalamin forms methyl or adenosyl depending on what's needed. But in, pra in practice, routinely, I see adenosyl giving the proper form that you need seems to work better. So I still tend to recommend give adenosyl if you need adenosyl, give methyl if you need methyl, give a blend if you need a blend. That moves us into our four cortisol patterns. This is probably the part of the webinar that uh, gets everybody excited because when we're looking at the adrenal page, the precision analytical recognizes that we are rather comprehensive and the metabolized cortisol dial can be challenging for people since they're not used to seeing it. You don't look at metabolized cortisol in saliva and you don't look at metabolized cortisol in serum. And so to see it in our dried urine test uh, can be challenging sometimes. So why do we even want to know these cortisol metabolites? Why do we have a metabolized cortisol dial? Metabolized cortisol roughly represents about 80% of the total cortisol production um, that comes from the body that's produced and metabolized out through the liver and then out into the urine. So it gives us an idea of how, like, what, what, the, what the possibility was, right? Free cortisol, we know all free hormones are like children. They can't be unattended at any time. So the majority of hormone uh, is bound up on binding globulins and only a tiny bit is free. So in this study, they said only, free is about 1%-ish. So having that metabolized cortisol gives you a rough idea of how much cortisol is made and metabolized in your day in total. Answers the question, can you even make cortisol? Can you even make cortisol? Then you use the free cortisol to assess, okay, you can make it. How much is free and available? How much is active? Because that active, that free, is what binds to receptors and does the things. You also need that free cortisol, though, to assess circadian rhythm. Is the rhythm normal or not? And then you look at them together to see what story they tell. If they align, then it's confirmatory. So let me mean. We have four patterns. Pattern one is when everything is high. The free cortisol is high. The metabolized cortisol is high. Because everything is high, this implies that there is a high output of cortisol. Your job is to figure out why and calm the HPA axis, address the cause, right? So is it stress? Is it infection? Is it inflammation? What have you, right? You're going to, you're going to look at this and go, wow, this person is really fired up. I need to address it. Please remember that all this high cortisol, just as an aside, can have an effect on male and female hormones. But in this example for female hormones, glucocorticoids can inhibit GnRH pulses. This results in less LH and less FSH stimulation. Your FH pulses have a lower, slower amplitude. Your LH pulses have a higher, faster amplitude. So your um, cortisol and even adrenaline, epinephrine, norepinephrine, can, through the feedback loop, slow the LH pulse down, and therefore you lose out on progesterone, but you maintain estrogen, and this can result in estrogen dominance in the luteal phase. Or 
it can be strong enough that it, it um, shuts everything down. Now you don't make LH and you don't make FSH, and now you have a long cycle, or maybe you have amenorrhea. So your glucocorticoid response can absolutely affect your GnRH, FSH, and LH. So keep this in mind when you are assessing high cortisol in combination with sex hormones for women. Also remember that high cortisol can result in low cortisol over time due to the negative feedback loop. So if your patient is coming to see you and they have very low cortisol, ask them what things were like months to years ago. Given the situation now with the pandemic, I am probably going to see a lot of high cortisols right now. And in months to a year from now, I'm going to see a lot of low cortisols where people were surviving the pandemic and then the feedback loop kicked in. And so we're going to be working a lot on their HPA axis, their brain, from the brain down to help relax the loop so they can make proper cortisol again. So again, as a visual reminder, high cortisol tells the hypothalamus and the pituitary not to make CRH or ACTH as much. And as a result, you get a lower cortisol output and a lower circadian rhythm, more like a flat circadian rhythm. That leads us to pattern two. This is when everything is low. You have low free cortisol, low metabolized cortisol. Because everything is low, this is exactly what we think. It implies a low output of cortisol. The HPA axis is not working. Now, this could be Addison's if it's low enough. It could actually be Addison's and then you would need further testing. But in lieu of Addison's, let's just say it's a decreased HPA axis. It will look like this low metabolized, low free on the circadian rhythm. And I strongly suspect in the next six months to two years, we're gonna see this a lot with people coming out of the pandemic. Now we get into patterns three and four. What happens when the dials don't match? They face different directions. So when free and metabolized cortisol are decidedly different, one is much lower or higher than the other, then abnormal cortisol clearance is implied. Why is that? Let's jump in. Pattern three, you have high free cortisol and low metabolized cortisol. So if the metabolite levels are genuinely or generally lower than free cortisol, this implies sluggish cortisol clearance. So metabolized cortisol is low in this case. It's low at 2,587. As a result, the free cortisol cannot get metabolized. So it stays free and comes through the urine as free. It's not getting metabolized. So in this case, the dials sort of, they face each other, right? They face in. The most common reason for this is hypothyroidism, even subclinical hypothyroidism, even just a conversion issue. TSH is fine, T4 is fine, but T3 is a little bit low. We see it all the time. We also observe this though with just general poor liver function and those with anorexia or disordered eating. Unfortunately, what I can't tell you about disordered eating or anorexia is how it affects every person's enzymes in their liver. For example, if somebody was anorexic in college for a couple of years, is that enough to affect the metabolized cortisol permanently? I don't know until we test. And if somebody has a long history of disordered eating in some way, and we see a low metabolized cortisol, again, People ask, is it permanent? Is it possible that their long histories made this permanent? I don't know until we work on it. That There has not been substantial research on that at all. We just know that in um, those with anorexia and a disordered eating, uh, current or past history, that they do see low metabolized cortisol. However, hypothyroidism in some form is the most common cause. Now on the, and I'm gonna explain why in just a second, but I want to get into the pattern four, which is when they face the opposite direction. Now you have very high metabolized cortisol. You have rapid cortisol production and clearance. And as a result, your free cortisol is low because it is getting swept out super quickly. The metabolize, metabolism is ramped up of cortisol and therefore free cortisol doesn't even have a fighting chance to stay around. It is getting metabolized and swept out into the urine. The most common causes for this with that rapid cortisol clearance, obesity is a big one. Your adipose tissue does wonders to cortisol. Your adipose tissue also tends to have a lot of the enzyme 11-beta-HSD1. 
it tends to rapidly activate cortisone into cortisol. Fat cells themselves, we often consider them as another endocrine gland. They're very pro-inflammatory and they can greatly affect your cortisol. But this rapid cortisol clearance, we also see with hyperthyroidism. Even people who are on too much thyroid medication or too much thyroid supplementation, so an induced hyperthyroid state, we will see rapid cortisol clearance. Long-term stress, possibly with chronic fatigue, although the research is mixed, the treatment address the cause, support the HPA axis without stimulating more cortisol production. So for example, in this case, you maybe don't use a whole lot of glandulars and licorice. Maybe you dial it back and look more at, of course, addressing the cause and things like adaptogens. But let's answer the question about thyroid and cortisol. Here are two cases. So we have, um, oops, top case, low free cortisol, really low at nine, bottom case, low free cortisol at 21. Both of them have a very low kind of flat pattern. If you just treated the free cortisol alone in both cases and you thought to yourself, self, this person doesn't make a lot of cortisol, I'm going to give them as much stimulatory things as I can think of, panics, licorice, cortef, glandulars, adaptogens, everything I can give them. The top person, you look at that metabolized cortisol and you would say, okay, everything's so low, that might be a good idea. Now, in the top person, it turns out they're on prednisone. But in the bottom person, you would see their metabolized cortisol is high. This person would not benefit from all the stimulatory stuff. In fact, they'd probably feel worse. They'd probably feel anxious and jittery and nervous, tired but wired couldn't sleep and they're gonna call you back complaining after maybe a couple weeks or so, maybe immediately. So like I said, the top one was actually prednisone suppression. So this is why it's really important to see um, the free and the metabolized. And the bottom one, true case, thyroid overdose. Their T4 and T3 is high. They had a low TSH. Um, so they'd done the Dutch test. We picked it up, suggested they do thyroid testing and they did. So with both of them, they have that low flat pattern. And if you just focus on free cortisol, you miss the bigger picture. How does thyroid directly impact cortisol clearance? So as someone becomes more hypothyroid, as their T4 goes down, their cortisol metabolism and clearance decreases, it goes down as well. As somebody becomes more hyperthyroid, their T4 goes up, their cortisol metabolism and clearance increases. And this makes sense when you think of the thyroid. When the thyroid slows down, it slows everything down, hair growth, skin turnover, digestion, metabolism, energy, everything slows down, including the metabolism of cortisol. When you're hyperthyroid, everything speeds up. Your temperature goes up, your heart rate goes up, you're sweating, your metabolism goes up, your GI or speeds up, your GI speeds up, and as a result, your cortisol clearance speeds up. So it's very related. In this actual case, what they did is they corrected the thyroid overdose, repeated the Dutch test, and now they have a proper dose of T4 and T3. The true picture of what's going on in their adrenal glands came forth. So they still have other work to do on their um, health and their HPA axis. They're still fired up for some other adrenal reason, infection, inflammation, stress, I don't, I don't know, I don't actually remember, but they, they, they had more work to do. But by fixing the thyroid dose, by pulling them out of hyperthyroidism, their circadian rhythm rebounded. And I don't, oh, I thought I circled it. So if you look to the left, when you see their diurnal pattern, their diurnal pattern a few slides ago showed that everything got suppressed, right? The free got suppressed because it was being metabolized so quickly. It didn't even have a fighting chance to have a circadian rhythm. Now that the thyroid is correct, everything is high, it shows there's actually a big underlying HPA access issue. So I get the question a lot, well, Carrie, how do I know what to treat first? Because we know the HPA axis directly impacts the thyroid. And now you're saying the thyroid can directly impact the HPA axis, cortisol metabolism. What do I treat first? I would suggest you treat them both. And in this case, in a lot of cases, I often, when I see this pattern on the Dutch test in particular, I say, why don't you treat the thyroid first for a couple weeks or a month? and then address the HPA axis at the same time, or maybe even the second step. So I suggest doing both because over and over time again, I will see people who will just, in that pattern, in a thyroid pattern, they will just treat the HPA axis and it takes much longer 
to get the results they're looking for. But when they treat both, when they affect both the thyroid, whether it's high or low, and they affect both a just general HPA support, that they get much better and much faster outcomes. And if you want to read all the studies on all of that, I have them listed there. So the metabolized cortisol helps confirm or further tell a story about your patient's HPA axis dysfunction. So now you will know when you look at page five of the Dutch Complete or Dutch Plus, if there are pattern one, two, three, or four. Is everything high? Is everything low? Do the dials face each other, indicating hypothyroidism? Do they face away from each other, indicating maybe hyperthyroidism, but maybe also obesity, infection, inflammation, chronic fatigue? And so you will just evaluate based on that. So let's talk about the systemic deactivation pattern where you have higher free cortisone and more cortisone metabolites, T-H-E, on the gauge. So when you're looking at page five on the Dutch test and you will see cortisol, uh, in this example, cortisol is on the left, cortisone is on the right. Why would somebody have, in this case, low free cortisol, but normal cortisone and favoring cortisone? Why is somebody flipping away from cortisol to cortisone? This is the systemic deactivation pattern. So when cortisone is higher and it's leaning towards cortisone THE, that enzyme 11-beta HSD2 is at play. It's, be, it's upregulated. 11-beta HSD2, which I'll show you in a second, is what deactivates cortisol to cortisone. Common causes are long-term stress or after an acute illness causing high cortisol. Fun fact, free unbound cortisol circulates at a thousand-fold the concentration of aldosterone. Why do we have 11-beta HSD2? It's like your force shield around your mineral corticoid receptors. So when your thousand-fold cortisols are rushing your mineral corticoid receptors, your 11-beta HSD2 can deactivate them to cortisone so that you don't have problems with your mineral corticoid receptors. It's supposed, it's supposed to try to protect you, right? But other reasons, so I said after an acute illness or in recovery, and some people do have an 11-beta HSD2 mutation. So if you need a little reminder, 11-beta uh, HSD1 activates to cortisol, 2 deactivates to cortisone. Your 1 is primarily in your adipose, your liver, and your central nervous system. Your 2 are around places where you have heavy mineral corticoid receptors, kidneys, salivary glands, sweat glands, and colon. So that's the deactivation pattern. So what do you do? Obviously, you address the cause. If somebody's really favoring cortisone, you have to figure out why. Why do they have cortisol bum rushing the mineral corticoid receptors? Why are they making so much cortisol? And address that. What you can do, um, the cheater method, is to use licorice. Not DGL. You need the glycerizin in the licorice. It's the glycerizin itself. That is the 11-beta HSD2 competitive inhibitor. And what it does is it um, helps to encourage more of the one so that you make cortisol, slows the breakdown of cortisol, uh, so you have more of it around. Now, I love licorice. It's dose dependent. So low dose, do you want to just nudge it? High dose, do you want to hit it really hard? A lot of great herbalists will say that licorice is a harmonizer. So you will often see a little bit of licorice, just a little bit, in herbal combinations because it helps all the other herbs in it play together. So they don't necessarily need to be afraid of licorice, just be dose dependent, cautious about it. And on the Dutch test, we tell you if they favor 11 beta HSD2 or one. If you're gonna put somebody on licorice, please be aware of high blood pressure and hypokalemia, which is low potassium, both can occur. I in fact have had two cases in my practice of hypokalemia where they ended up in the hospital with low potassium because the patient loved licorice so much that they wouldn't go off it even when I told them to go off of it. They were afraid it would make them, by going off of it, they would be tired. And, uh, but instead, it ended up with low potassium. Side note on 11-beta HSD2, phthalates, organotins, perfluorinated substances, all inhibit 11-beta HSD2. So what does this mean? This means environmental toxicants may be another reason for high free cortisol. So if you have a man or a woman with high free cortisol, and you suspect a lot of exposure, you're doing other testing, looking at exposures to them, that could be a reason. Those things are nasty, aren't they? Environmental toxicants, no bueno. What happens if they have higher free cortisone, but their 11 beta HSD1 is higher? So why would that, so that's the opposite of what you would think. Why do they have cortisone, but not two? Why is the one higher? So we call this the specifically at the kidney pattern. <laughs> 
So the kidney is trying to protect itself. So in this example, cortisol is on the left, cortisone is on the right, cortisone is in range, but they favor cortisol. The little gauge is leaning towards cortisol, meaning the rest of the body is keeping cortisol active. But when it comes through the urine, it's deactivating to cortisone. So there are higher levels of 11 beta HSD2 in the kidney. Why? Because of the mineral corticoid receptors. And in some people, they have lots of 11 beta HSD2 or they have an upregulated 11 beta HSD2. This obviously doesn't happen for everybody. Some are definitely more reactive. So when high or like normal levels of free cortisol hit the kidneys, the kidney says, oh no, that is too much cortisol. I'm going to deactivate you to cortisone to protect the receptors and then I'm gonna urinate you out and you will show up higher, higher free cortisone on the Dutch test. So let me go back and show you that really quick. Again, this is one of those like deep patterns that experienced Dutch practitioners get really excited about. So if you see low free cortisol, higher free cortisone, but the gauge is saying they should have higher cortisol, suspect it's right at the kidney. So what does this mean? This means their cortisol was probably a lot higher prior to urinating it out. So that low free cortisol is kind of a fake out. It's like a false low free cortisol. It's not actually what's happening systemically, which is why the cortisone marker is a better indicator here. You're gonna look at that cortisone and go, you were cortisol before you hit the kidney and got deactivated. So I'm gonna look at you as a better indicator. I know it's tricky, right? So it like I said, it implies higher free cortisone implies cortisol might be higher in circulation than levels indicate. So you gotta look at that gauge. You gotta take that 11 beta HSD2 and one in mind. So as Mark says, the higher cortisone pulls my conclusion that cortisol is probably higher. Don't worry. You can listen to this webinar and watch these slides as many times as possible if this is a little bit confusing. All right, having said that, you wanna see if they're on ACE inhibitors or HCTZ, the diuretic, because we see the same pattern. So it may not be a systemic anything. It may be medication induced. Here's a patient on an ACE inhibitor. They're uh, favoring cortisol, but their cortisol is actually low. Their cortisone, oops, let me go back. Their cortisone is in range at 360. So an ACE inhibitor will make it look like that uh, deactivation at the kidney part. Why is that? Because ACE inhibitors will increase 11 beta HSD2. They deactivate. So the increased free cortisol conversion to cortisone in the kidney to protect the kidney and reduce blood pressure. Why do you give somebody an ACE inhibitor? To reduce blood pressure. It's doing its job. So check medications and don't blame the HPA excess and don't blame the 11 beta HSD2 it's the ACE inhibitor doing its job. HCTZ and higher free cortisone, we see the same pattern. Unfortunately, I cannot find that in the literature. ACE inhibitor, are, there are, I have two studies listed there. Uh, this is a known fact. The HCTZ, I cannot find it in the literature. We just tend to see it over and over and over again when people check that they're on uh, this diuretic. Now, on the flip side, the other diuretic, furosemide, is an 11 beta HD, HSD2 inhibitor. So this might render the free cortisone to be lower than the free cortisol. So you'll get the opposite picture. I know, makes your head spin. This is why it's important to pay attention to what medications they're on because it affects all of these enzymes, right, through the body. And so it can actually cause the free cortisol, furosemide, the diuretic, can actually cause the free cortisol to be higher than the cortisone. So if you see they're on furosemide, just look at the dials and see how it's affecting them. Let's talk about hydrocortisone. Speaking of uh, medications, this is the hydrocortisone cream pattern. This patient ran a Dutch test. The salivary free cortisol is on the left and you can see it is really elevated. It's this high elevated weird line, like a ski slope, right? That comes down. And then their salivary free cortisol pattern is in range. It's in the blue uh, um, reference range. So cortisol is high. Cortisone is where basically where it should be. And their free cortisol, oops, their salivary free cortisol total is really high, 36.38. So why would this be? Or do you immediately start to think, oh my gosh, HPA upregulation. They're probably inflamed, infection, you know, stress. Turns out they run hydrocortisone cream. Hydrocortisone is cortisone that has gone through hydrogenation to become cortisol. Hydrocortisone is cortisol. 
It's a very confusing naming thing by the pharmaceutical industry. I don't know why they did that. It's unfortunate. So if somebody's on hydrocortisone cream, understand you're just giving them cortisol. So metabolized cortisols may be normal. The free cortisol is super high because they're taking exogenous cortisol and their free cortisone will probably be normal. So in this example, the patient, the, the partner, not the patient was using the cream. So they were getting transference. So you have to, when we see this pattern, you know, we tend to point it out to you, like something's wrong. I bet they're on some sort of high cortisol. They're on some sort of cortisol. So avoid partner contamination, or if they're on it themselves, work to figure out the cause and stop the hydrocortisone cream use. Now, hydrocortisone cream is different than steroid use. If they're on prednisone, if they're on a steroid inhaler, a steroid nasal spray, that's different. That will actually shut the HPA axis down. Hydrocortisone is cortisol. Prednisone is not. Prednisone will take over and suppress the HPA axis. In these cases of people on hydrocortisone cream or taking cortisol, the cortisone pattern is a decent surrogate and can be used to assess what you would think the normal cortisol pattern would be if they were not on the cream. So it is really nice and helpful that Dutch includes cortisone because in these weird special cases and patterns and pearls, you have a backup plan to look to go, what does your cortisol really look like if you weren't doing these things? Oh, this is what it looks like. We'll look at the cortisone instead. Sleep apnea example. This is a male in his 30s. He had severe, has severe sleep apnea, was not using his CPAP machine, overweight, high blood pressure, waking fatigue, and depression. So you can see his waking point is quite low. It's the, he's the, the blue solid line. Um, and then he does spike up and then back down again. He did his cortisol awakening response. Afternoon is high and then night is borderline low. And then his metabolized cortisol is elevated at 10,300. So just judging by his symptoms, knowing he has sleep apnea, he probably has low androgens. He probably has high estrogens. He probably has blood sugar, insulin issues. And he probably, what we know is cardiometabolic disease. Sleep apnea does a lot to the body. When you are missing out on oxygenation to the brain, you are do doing yourself a lot of harm. The hippocampus shows both damage and dysfunction in obstructive sleep apnea, which may contribute to memory, autonomic, and depressive symptoms in that disorder. The hippocampus is also what controls the cortisol awakening response. So what you need to do is affect the sleep apnea, get that addressed, because by uh, improving oxygenation to the brain, improving the cortisol awakening response, you can help improve his circadian rhythm, androgen production, blood sugar, insulin function, inflammatory response, and more in a big way. So do not blow off sleep apnea. Don't blow off disorderly uh, breathing, mouth breathers, snorers, any of that. They have to be worked up. Here's a traumatic brain injury example. This is a male in his 50s. He had a car accident resulting in a concussion and did the Dutch test a couple months later because, of course, he was not doing or feeling well. This is just his cortisol page. His hormonal page looked just as bad. His testosterone and androgens were quite low. But you will see his total DHEA production on, on the Dutch test. That's where we add up the DHEAS, the etiocalanolone, and the androsterone. His free cortisol was borderline low. His metabolized cortisol was low. Um, and his cortisone is low. Everything's sort of like low, right? And then as I told you, his testosterone and in, in, in like his androgens weren't that great either. So with a TBI, you have to address the TBI. I will, people will ask me, well, you know, what, what herb should I put him on? What, what supplement do I put him on? And it's, it's you, all of those things are wonderful, right? I love the brain support and the adaptogens and have you, but whatever you do, or whoever you refer him to, to help uh, address the damage done by the TBI will only help the long-term output um, of all of his hormones, his uh, sex hormones and his uh, cortisol hormones. Now, this applies to women as well. This is a male, this is a male case, but it doesn't matter. If a female gets a TBI, we see the same thing. We see her hormones are a mess. We see her adrenal hormones are a mess. So let's do a quick bonus. Estrogen metabolism. I know this is not the HPA, but uh, estrogen metabolism is my favorite subject, and I want to just make sure everybody uh, is an expert on it or gets a quick little review if you haven't heard me talk about it before. So a few slides on this. Again, remember, these are the dials to come. You're getting a sneak peek of what's going to happen in our new, uh, fingers crossed, upcoming report. So estrone and estradiol are there at the top in this female case. Estrone, uh, excuse me, is high. Estradiol is also high. 
Then we look at the two, the four, and the 16 hydroxy. Um, just like normal, they're just rearranged a little bit differently. And in this case, the two hydroxy dial is low at, at 4.8. The 4-hydroxy is in the range and the 16-hydroxy is high. Remember, 16-hydroxy is estrogenic. It is not as estrogenic as estradiol, but it does bind to and has decent af affinity for estrogen receptors. Somebody with high 16-hydroxy can have um, heavy periods, clots, fibroids, endometriosis, full tender breasts at PMS time. All of that can happen because of 16-OH, because it is estrogenic. Because it's estrogenic, it's also beneficial for bone. So we do call 16-OH the proliferative estrogen metabolite. So this person is estrogen dominant and favoring the 16 pathway. In addition, the way that we at Dutch evaluate phase two is we look at methylation through COMT and we look how you go from a hydroxy to a methoxy and we even give you a methylation activity gauge to let you know how that conversion is taking place. So in this case, the, per, the methoxy is in range. It's in between the stars. It's just not fast enough. We want the methoxy conversion, or excuse me, the hydroxy conversion into methoxy to be able to keep up. So if the two hydroxy is in the red, I want the methoxy in the red as well. So this is slow. Why do I care about phase two? Because your phase one metabolites are free radicals, right? and I want them to be neutralized, made water soluble and excreted. Phase three is then through the GI tract. We learn it when I do my full webinar, we learn it as phase one, two, two and a half, which involves the bile, then three, but you always address it as phase three, which is through your intestines, two and a half, two, and then one. You wanna make sure the intestines are getting it out, the bile is healthy, the COMT methylation is working, and then you affect phase one. It's just like in a house, you wanna make sure your sewer line is open and clear before you affect any of the other um, uphill pipes. So don't just put everybody on DIM or indol 3 carbonyl They are specific for phase one estrogen detoxification. They do mainly upregulate your CYP1A1 by uh, activating the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, but you have to open up phase two and phase three. How do you open up phase two? Look at COMPT. Look at those methyl donors like magnesium and CME, which are the two big enzyme uh, coenzymes. Glycine, methionine, choline, methylated B vitamins, and zinc can all be really helpful. And then what affects COMP, COMT? There are a lot of things that can affect COMT. I have a list here just as a reminder. So if any of these are true for your patient, then it could be affecting the way they get from a hydroxy free radical state into a neutralized methoxy state. So you want to make sure that this is addressed. And then lastly, what do you do about that phase three? You are working to affect their estrogen microbiome, which is known as their estrobilome, my favorite word in medicine right now. So address the gut microbiome, address their diet, make sure they're getting fruits, veggies, particularly fiber, looking at like raw, organic, washed carrots, the real carrot, the full carrot, not a baby carrot. The um, insoluble fiber on the outside and inside of the carrot are very helpful for getting estrogens out. Avoid the standard Western diet, be selective with antibiotic use, reduce or eliminate alcohol, avoid and minimize toxicants, look at your pre and probiotic um, uh, and resist pre and probiotics and your resistant starches, and then the supplement calcium deglucurate, CDG supplementation. Please remember calcium deglucurate does not fix the problem with the estrobilome. It is a great band-aid. It just helps while you are healing and improving the um, micro, the, uh, the trying to get the beta-glucuronidase levels down. It's that beta-glucuronidase enzyme that's affected by um, constipation and just diet and toxicants and all of these things. So lastly, as we wrap up, how do you choose the right test? As in, again, we have the Dutch complete, like I said in the beginning, this is your four urine, only urine collections throughout the day with a fifth overnight collection uh, if they have insomnia. It does include all the sex hormones, including the metabolites, including the estrogen detoxification I was just talking about, including the 5-alpha reductase, which I talked about earlier, the cortisol and cortisone metabolites in the pattern, melatonin, your 8-OHDG nutritional and neurotransmitter metabolites. The Dutch Plus is everything that I talked about, plus the addition of the salivary swabs for the cortisol awakening response. 
So if you need more data points, if you need more up close, detailed look at their cortisol pattern, specifically in the morning, you need that cortisol awakening response, you're going to consider the Dutch Plus. If they also have insomnia, we do include an extra overnight salivary sample that they just pop the, the salivate swab in their mouth when they wake up at three in the morning, stick it back in the tube, and then try to go back to bed. We do offer the car all by itself. So you do get the four, or excuse me, the five points in total. So the three points in the morning, waking 30 minutes later, 30 minutes after that, plus the afternoon and bedtime sample and the insomnia sample. So you get a lot of data points if you're just looking to focus on the car and you don't need anything else like estrogens or testosterones or metabolites or you know organic acids or melatonin or any of that. You just want the car. This is a really great option. And lastly, my favorite test for cycling women who are struggling throughout the cycle, the cycle mapping test. So if she should um, be cycling or she is cycling, but she says, I'm very symptomatic at certain key points in my cycle, this is a great option. So you can literally pinpoint those days and see what is going on. And of course you can combine it with the Dutch Complete. And lastly, if you need more resources, absolutely give us a call, go online, sign up to be a provider. For an all new providers, we do have a special where you get 50% off up to your first five kits when you sign up. So it's quite a deal, especially if you're looking to practice uh, or to test maybe yourself, um, your family, your significant other, your staff while you are working through the pandemic right now. Remember, we do drop ship right to your patients um, so that we uh, can just get it out immediately. Your patients collect, get it back, and you will have the results and continue on your telemedicine way. So that concludes our talk. We are a smidge over an hour. I appreciate your time. Definitely follow us on social media. We do a lot, a lot, a lot of free education on social media. We do a lot of um, announcements on social media and you know we, we love following you and we love seeing what you're doing when it comes to Dutch Test and helping to answer questions. So again, my name is Dr. Carrie Jones and thank you so much. Okay, Carrie, let's take just a couple questions here. Um, is there a specific test for hypothalamus and pituitary dysfunction portion of the axis, or will we always be looking at the cortisol patterns to determine the HPA dysfunction? That's a great question. So you can do, not through Dutch testing, but you can do like CRH and ACTH testing. Um, you'll hear of like the ACTH stimulation test and, and things like that. So, and you can just draw a morning ACTH test uh, in blood to see how ACTH is working first thing in the morning. Uh, but it is a blood draw, it is, it is not part of the Dutch test. And you can put it all together with a Dutch test to see the downstream and the pattern and then more of what's happening up in the brain. Okay, if patients are taking prescription thyroid medication and you prescribe adrenal support to be taken within 30 minutes of waking, what is your advice for when to take thyroid medication and adrenal support? Do you have yes. them take it together? No, I do not, so, um, sort of. Uh, so if they're taking it in the morning, and as we know, thyroid medication is a diva. She has to be the only thing on your, in an empty stomach uh, to absorb on her own. So in that case, you have to wait. So in that case, I do recommend the 30 minutes, but the thyroid medication is the one caveat. So you do have to wait 30 to 60 minutes before you can take any adrenal support. Now, you could, um, get away with some nutrients in thyroid. So for example, that I mean, it'd be B vitamins on an empty stomach, you can handle it, but B vitamins on an empty stomach or even maybe something like vitamin C, but it's, it's, it's the, you know, the iron, the calcium, the magnesium, the tannins, the phytates, that's what all binds up thyroid. And in, in herbs, you have to be careful with that. So I am, I do push out my adrenal support for my morning thyroid takers. I have had thyroid takers who will consider switching and do their thyroid at night, or maybe they already take their thyroid at night. Um, I have thyroid takers who take their thyroid, they love their coffee on waking, and so they will set their alarm for, like just swallow their thyroid, go right back to sleep, and then when they do wake up for real at six or seven or whenever, um, then I will have them take their adrenal right at that time. But if they're just a pretty classic, I wake up, I take my thyroid medication and get out of bed, then they have to wait. Okay. Um... Do we need to ask patients to stop adaptogen herbs, pregnenolone, DHEA supplements before saliva and urine sample collection? If so, how many days before sample collection? 
Yes. So with um, adaptogenic herbs or any herb for that matter, please keep in mind that the actual half-life of the herb is fast. It's, it's, you know, if you take ashwagandha, it's, it's out of the body pretty quickly. It's the effect that you need to wear off. So if you want somebody's true baseline without ashwagandha, unfortunately, we generally suggest you have to wait a couple weeks um, and sometimes even months to go back to a baseline, unless it's working and like, everything you're doing is working, then it, they may not re, re, um, fall back on a baseline. You know, they may not regress. They may actually be pretty good. So most people keep their patients on their herbs while they're doing the test because they don't want them to stop for weeks mm -hmm. to see about if there's a wear off effect. Now, oral pregnenolone, oral progesterone, oral DHEA, you do have to stop, and there are instructions in the collection of the kit because um, the first pass effect will make those hormones appear much, 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 much higher because they come out through the urine than they actually are in circulation. So you'll just follow the recommendation um, as it's in the instruction kit. Okay. Um, how long should you stop a steroid inhaler before doing a test? <laughs> That is a great question. If they have been on the steroid inhaler, um, it's dose and length dependent. So if they, um, it, like, perfect example, it's spring season, people are using their spring allergy steroid inhalers all the time now, every day. They do it consistently for three months and then they want to do a Dutch test. Unfortunately, we don't know how long they have to stop before the HPA will quote snap back to pre-steroid days. So we generally sort of give a recommendation of if you've been doing the steroid every day, it's probably going to take a couple of weeks for the effect to wear off on it. Now, if they're just doing a steroid inhaler hit or miss, like maybe they use it before they exercise here and there, then a week, you know, a couple days, especially if they're only using it sporadically, then it's not having the HPA effect as if somebody's doing it every day. Same goes for nasal spray. If you're on an allergy nasal spray like Nasonex, um, and you do it every single day, twice a day, um, that will take longer for the effect to wear off of the HPA axis. How much longer though? It depends on the person. So we just sort of generally sweeping, say, try give it a couple weeks. Um, would you recommend either the Dutch Plus or the Dutch Adrenal to monitor hydrocortisone overdose or underdose and dosing time? That Yeah, well, so the Dutch Plus will include all the other hormones, the sex hormones. So if the sex hormones are something that you need, then depth, absolutely include the Dutch Plus. And if you're just trying to mi monitor hydrocortisone um, dosing, then I um, you could you could actually do either the Dutch Plus or the Dutch com um, Complete. In that case, what I would recommend is that you call or write the clinical team and let us know how often and how much the patient is taking hydrocortisone because everyone does it different. Some people just take five milligrams in the morning. Some people take 10 milligrams in the morning and five at lunch and five at three o'clock. And so it's very variable. And then we can guide you on when to collect, how to collect, what to expect, and then when to take their next dose if they're taking um, multiple doses through the day. If they're just on a single dose, if they're just like, well, I just take 15 milligrams in the morning, then um, it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, but it's the multiple doses that we try to guide you on. Okay, great. So one last question. Um, what might the reasons be for super high melatonin on a Dutch test if the patient's not supplementing? Could it possibly be infections, too much light therapy? <laughs> um, it might be. We do, you can, a melatonin is an antioxidant, so it could be gut related because majority of your melatonin is made in the gut. So um, if they have any kind of gut infections, celiac disease, you know, anything, anything, inflammation in the gut, uh, uh, IBS, IBD, that can increase melatonin. If they're on other supplements such as 5-H, anything tryptophan related. So if they're on tryptophan, 5-HTP, that can push, of course, the melatonin pathway. We do see um, high melatonin in certain foods, especially pistachios and dark cherries. So if somebody has eaten pistachios or uh, where we live in the Pacific Northwest, cherry season, we will then start to see lots of high levels of melatonin because of the melatonin um, in those foods. Uh, and then lastly, um, stress. Now, stress won't raise it up into the thousands, but it can raise it into the, you know, hundred to hundreds. We have seen that. So cortisol will be quite high. Um, stress is reported high. And then we will, even though cortisol can suppress melatonin in some people, it actually drives more of the antioxidant uh, production. Um, and then we'll see it higher then as well. But I will say for melatonin, um, having 
worked for Dutch since 2012. It's amazing the number of patients who say they're not taking melatonin. And I believe, I believe them, they're not taking just a straight melatonin supplement that says melatonin on it, but they're taking some, something else for sleep. They're taking like calm or they're taking, they're drinking sleepy time tea with melatonin in it. They're, you know, they're, they're taking some other kind of bedtime support to calm the mind. And it turns out it has two milligrams of melatonin in it. And they just didn't know to read the label because they're thinking it's for something else. Um, or they're thinking it's just, well, it says sleepy time tea and didn't realize it has, you know, chamomile, skull cap, holy basil and melatonin in it. And so definitely reading all the labels, we find over and over and over that people are shocked and go, oh, I've been taking melatonin this whole time and didn't know. Okay, I'm going to do, actually, I'm going to throw you one more question. <laughs> yes. Um, if a patient's been diagnosed with endometriosis and uh, they come into the practitioner office for infertility issues um, because they've been trying to get pregnant, is it helpful to do a Dutch test? And if so, which one would you recommend? Honestly, for fertility, I absolutely love the, and especially endometriosis, um, I love the cycle mapping with the Dutch Complete because I want to see what's happening with the rise and fall of estrogen progesterone through their whole cycle. And then I want all the other markers such as estrogen metabolism. I want androgens. I want cortisol as it, as it relates to their fertility journey. And then also how that could have an effect on endometriosis. And we know endometriosis is very, very um, inflammatory and it's very reactive to inflammation and so we can see a lot of that sort of inflammatory pattern on the dutch test but i would say the cycle mapping is probably my favorite in a fertility journey if they have endometriosis all right that that will uh, be a wrap for today everyone thanks so much again for joining us and look for us in a couple weeks in may we'll have a, another webinar for you thanks everyone thanks dr Thank jones